Greetings everyone and welcome to Ion Africa, our weekly seminary series. My name is Awasar. I'm Assistant Director for Academic Affairs at Michigan State University's uh, African Studies Center. And Ion Africa is our weekly seminary series. I'm very delighted today to have uh, Dr. Dennis Lohman as our guest speaker. Uh, before I turn it on to him, a brief introduction. Uh, professor Lohman is a professor of African history at the University of Memphis, a specialist in the history of West Africa, especially the nation of Ghana. He is a past president of the Ghana Studies Association. Dr. Lohman's publications include Colonial Africa, 1884-1994, second edition, published by Oxford University Press in 2019. His next book on historic links between Africa and Cuba will be published by Ohio University Press in its short histories of Africa series. Dr. Lohman is the recipient of numerous teaching honors, including the Thomas W. Briggs Foundation's Excellence in Teaching Award. Thank you very much for being here. We are delighted to have you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Saar. Thank you for this uh, invitation to speak with um, Michigan State uh, University African Studies Center today. And thank you to everybody who is on this uh, virtual call. I hope um, uh, you enjoy my presentation and I welcome any questions or comments uh, when we finish. So um, I um, just to sort of begin this talk, I was gonna uh, give kind of a background on how I, uh, came upon this topic. Let me see if my, there we go. Um, so some years ago, I was in a British Airways office in Accra, Ghana, and uh, seated next to me was a Ghanaian man who was dressed, uh, looked like to me like a, a Hindu priest. And uh, we started chatting and talking and he informed me that he was a, a devotee at the Hare Krishna temple in uh, outside Accra. And I had never um, been to the Hare Krishna temple or knew about it. And I have to admit, I was immediately uh, excited because uh, as a vegetarian, I was delighted that I might be able to uh, visit the temple and get some delicious Hare Krishna vegetarian food, which I remembered fondly when I was a graduate student at UCLA in the 90s. And um, so he invited me to visit the uh, temple. And I think my first uh, sort of intellectual or academic interest was in um, this, you know, really intriguing uh, environment where Ghanaians um, were embracing, a, you know, South Asian religion and wearing South Asian clothing and, uh, you know, chanting in Sanskrit and pursuing a vegetarian diet. Um, but then the more I continued to visit the temple over the months and years, and I got to know many of the devotees, I discovered this really fascinating link between the temple and the introduction of ISKCON in Ghana to an African-American guru in the Hare Krishna movement. And then I also observed over those visits, the number of African uh, devotees from other parts of the continent, as well as uh, African diasporic devotees. So I started to do research on those links and those connections and tried to look for archival materials and uh, this has been sort of a side project I've been working on over the years. Every time I go to Ghana, I try to look for some things in the archives and interview some of the members of the ISKCON temple. And uh, so what I'm gonna do to, today is kind of give you an overview of this research in progress. Um, what I'm gonna do first is kind of provide a brief overview of the origins of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness uh, in case uh, any of our listeners um, might not be too familiar with ISKCON, what's popularly known as the Hare Krishna movement. Uh, then I'm going to give a contextualization of what I mean by the term revolutionary Ghana. Uh, I'm going to give a, a slight, uh, a short uh, background on the history of Hinduism in Ghana, and then uh, focus on the topic, which is the, a discussion of the beginnings of ISKCON in Ghana its African diasporic links, and particularly the central figure of an individual named Bhakti Tirta Swami. And then finally, um, you know, as a conclusion, I'll sort of talk about ISKCON's possible impact on this period that I call uh, the revolutionary era in Ghana 
and the significance of this research. So that's sort of my plan. I'm gonna share a lot of images just to kind of give you a feel for the topic and the places and the people I'm talking about. And again, I welcome uh, any questions or comments at the end. So first I wanted to talk a little bit about the research that's been already done on Hinduism in Ghana, Hinduism in Africa. Um, and there are some works out there. Uh, the most important work on the history of Hinduism in Ghana is this book, Hindu Gods in West Africa by uh, Professor Waku, who's at Florida International University. Um, and he's mostly interested, he uh, comes from an anthropological background, and he's mostly interested in looking at this like cultural synthesis or this cultural syncretism between uh, uh, Ghanaian devotees of both the Iskhan temple and another temple called the Hindu Monastery of Africa, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And that cultural synthesis between uh, Ghanaian cultures, particularly our Khan culture and uh, Hinduism or South Asian culture. So there's been a number of other uh, authors uh, that I'll make reference to in this talk as well that look at this topic. And they're mainly anthropologists and scholars of religion who are uh, interested mostly in that kind of cultural connection or that cultural change uh, that occurs in West Africa. Um, there are a number of studies published by uh, members or supporters of ISKCON um, on the topic of Hinduism in Africa, indirectly, not directly. So this is a biography of a Bhakti Tirtha uh, Swami, uh, Swami Bhakti Tirtha that I mentioned before, um, written by a, a prominent uh, writer within the ISKCON movement, Stephen Rosen. So these works tend to be, you know, focus more on the teachings of uh, the gurus that were responsible for bringing ISKCON to Africa. Um, this book on Bhakti Tirta Swami um, deals with his entire life, and I'll provide a, a biography of him a little bit later. Um, and, you know, only uh, mentions uh, places like Ghana and other parts of Africa as part of his larger proselytizing uh, efforts around the world. So not necessarily focused on Ghana or in Africa in general. And then um, I wanted to mention that, of course, the connections uh, between India and Africa and the existence of Hinduism is a lot stronger in Eastern and Southern Africa uh, for obvious reasons. The historic Indian diaspora, which exists in countries like uh, Kenya and Uganda and South Africa. And those linkages and um, the you know, different issues related to that are explored in this new book um, that was published by a good friend of mine, Shobhana Shankar, An Uneasy Embrace. So there's a whole literature, or there's more literature, let's say, on connections with East and Southern Africa and India and Hinduism in Africa and East and Southern Africa. So that's to kind of give a background of what um, you know, has been published already on uh, Africa and Hinduism, and then to kind of you know, give the background as to how my research uh, kind of uh, adds to this literature. So I said I wanted to talk a little bit about the origins of ISKCON, and I'm gonna read a little bit in this section because um, I have everything written out here, but the International Society for Krishna Consciousness was established in 1966 in New York City by a 76 year old Indian immigrant named A.C. Bhakti Vandanta Swami Prabhupada. Born in Calcutta in 1896, he spent most of his adult life married to children and owned a small pharmaceutical business until he took a vow of renunciation at the age of 54. Inspired by his guru, he famously sailed to the United States in 1965 with little money, a few processions, and no sponsoring organization with the intention of propagating Hinduism in the West. Um, the particular brand of Hinduism uh, that um, this Swami um, uh, uh, propagated traces its origins to the early 16th century and focuses on the worship of Krishna, the most mildly, widely revered deity in Hinduism, especially through the chanting of the Maha Mantra, the great mantra, which consists of the three names of God in Sanskrit, Hari, Krishna, and Rama. Now popularly known as the Hare Krishna mantra, and that's where 
uh, ISKCON gets its popular name, thanks to the movement Swami Prabhupada started. Um, the Hare Krishna mantra is there, it's Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Um, if you are a fan of 1970s era rock and pop music, you would know that mantra from the George Harrison uh, song, My Sweet Lord. Improbably, within a year of Swami Prabhupada's arrival in the United States, a storefront temple was established in New York's Greenwich Village, and a small group of devotees formed a center in San Francisco. From those humble origins, ISKCON grew into a worldwide movement over the following decade, the last of Swami Prabhupada's life, receiving generous support from celebrities like George Harrison of the Beatles, as I just mentioned, as well as scorn from others who considered it a dangerous cult. A popular culture depiction of ISKCON during the 1970s was a weary traveler in an airport being accosted by a cheerful but persistent group of young Hare Krishna devotees dressed in the attire of Hare Krishna, of Hindu monks, offering Swami Prabhupada's books for sale. Um, and you know that, uh, those of you familiar with, again, 1970s pop culture, um, that was not so positively portrayed in the comedy Airplane. Indeed, the three main methods of spreading Krishna consciousness in the terminology of ISKCON are book distribution, particularly Swami Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is, which you see there in the bottom left. Uh, street chanting, when devotees sing the Hare Krishna mantra accompanied by percussive instruments and serving vegetarian food offered to Krishna. So if any of you have encountered, encountered uh, Krishna consciousness, um, you know, at a university campus or uh, in the city street or at a festival, um, we'll be familiar with this you know, scene of uh, devotees uh, chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, dancing, and usually providing uh, delicious vegetarian food. Um, I spent a, a sabbatical once at the University of Florida where the Hare Krishna devotees serve lunch every day in front of the library um, because their major center is right there outside Gainesville. At the time of Swami Prabhupada's death, in 1977, ISKCON encompassed over 100 temples and farm communities around the world, as well as the Bhakti Vedanta Book Trust, the movement's publishing house. He had initiated many disciples, of which the most senior were charged with guiding and expanding ISKCON, and others who continued his work of spreading Krishna consciousness, including Bhakti Tirta Swami. The only black member, the only black leader in the movement, the only black guru in the movement. It was this fascinating African American guru who was most influential in bringing ISKCON to Ghana in the revolutionary period of the early 1980s. So now I want to um, take a moment to talk a little bit about this era for you to get a, a feel for the period in Ghana's history in which ISKCON was introduced into the country. Um, after the reactionary 1966 coup against its first president, Kwame Krumah, Ghana entered an over one decade long period of political instability and economic decline, characterized by a series of short-lived military regimes, mass emigration, and widespread corruption. Then on June 4th, 1979, a group of junior officers led by Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings, pictured here, and named the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, removed senior officers from power, executed several of them, organized and held free elections, and handed over power to a democratically elected government all within three months. And here's uh, one of those famous images of the time of Flight Lieutenant Rawlings uh, standing on top of a tank, addressing a crowd uh, in, in 1979. These events mark the beginning of the era I term revolutionary Ghana. The June 4th uprising, as it came to be known to supporters of Rawlings, or the June 4th coup, as his detractors call it, still elicits strong opinions and feelings in Ghana. 
as evidenced by the recent book by Avina uh, Asare, Truth Without Reconciliation, A Human Rights History of Ghana, some Ghanaians view this era as a dark time in the nation's history, characterized by violence, kidnapping, and murder. Yet many Ghanaians also recognize it as the beginnings of a transformative period when accountability and stability were gradually restored to the governance of uh, in Ghana. From a historical perspective, it is important to highlight the widespread, enthusiastic, genuine, and well-documented support for J.J. Rawlings from 1979 onwards. He was properly known as uh, Junior Jesus, J.J. Junior Jesus uh, at the time, as well as the societal transformations which took place uh, over the following decade and beginning with the intervention of June 4th. So even today, you know, um, the opposition party right now, the National Democratic Congress uh, hosts a June 4th or a commemorates June 4th every year with a ceremony um, which, you know, the ruling uh, party and its supporters, uh, you know, uh, kind of disparages commemorating a very uh, violent uh, event in Ghana's history. Um, so these, you know, these uh, historic events are still uh, kind of traumatic for a lot of Ghanaians. And it's in this time period, uh, 1979 onwards, that ISKCON uh, comes to Ghana along with a, a number of other religions and political ideologies. In September 1979, Hila Laman of the People's National Party took power and Ghana's third republic was proclaimed. So Hil Laman was a uh, sort of recruitment leader from Northern Ghana and Rawlings and the AFRC handed over power to Liman uh, as they promised within three months. Many of the societal problems that led to the June 4th uprising persisted however, and there was pervasive opposition to the government, particularly after striking public workers, sector workers were dismissed. Then on December 31, 1981, a little over two years after handing over power, Rawlings returned to power, this time as chairman of the seven member Provisional National Defense Council. And there's a photo of um, JJ Rawlings, of course, next to uh, Thomas Sankara, the leader of Burkina Faso from 1983 onwards. So th this was, you know, not only a revolutionary period in uh, Ghana in particular, but in the region as well. Um, and Kruma, I'm sorry, Rawlings and Sankara were very close. Um, they kind of espoused similar kind of uh, socialist Pan-African rhetoric. Um, and they were both also uh, allied with um, Cuba's Castro and uh, Libya's Gaddafi, right? So this is a kind of revolutionary era in the area, but particularly in Ghana. Again, the debate over whether the December 31st um, takeover should be characterized as a revolution or a coup continues to divide the Ghanaian public and political parties, as well as scholars of Ghana's history. Generally speaking, those who supported Rawlings used the term 31st December revolution, while his detractors argue Rawlings simply staged another coup this time against a democratically elected government. Some of our listeners might have also heard of the December 31st women's movement, which was a uh, grassroots uh, women's organization uh, founded by uh, Nana Kanedu uh, Ajuman Rawlings, the um, wife of JJ Rawlings during this time. Nevertheless, based on various standard definitions of revolution, as well as the economic, political, and societal changes that occurred in Ghana immediately after 31st December 1981 and during the decade that followed, I again assert that we should refer to the 1980s, the years of PNDC rule as a revolutionary era in Ghana's history. Though Rawlings famously abandoned a purely socialist path in favor of the structural, structural adjustment programs of capitalist institutions in the mid 1980s, and this occurred in the context of numerous challenges, um, such as the forced deportation of 1 million Ghanaians from Nigeria, as well as regional drought and famine. 
The rhetoric of the times, the spirit of the nation, the societal changes were truly radical, exploratory, and transformative. This revolutionary period was marked by the circulation and embrace of new and existing ideology. Uh, the explosion of Pentecostal churches and embrace, uh, sorry, the uh, explosion of Pentecostal churches at the expense of traditional Christian denominations and the concurrent displacement of high life music by gospel are the most studied and impactful examples from this era. So many um, scholars are focused on this kind of uh, sudden explosion of Pentecostal charismatic Christianity uh, in, in Ghana in the 1980s and indeed throughout the world at this time, places like Brazil as well. Um, and then also this kind of new gospel music uh, genre that just sort of explodes during that time as well. Um, but it certainly wasn't the only uh, new kind of uh, ideological uh, change taking place at the time in Ghana. In terms of political ideology, socialism and pan-Africanism dominated public discourse in the early 1980s. As the government publicly allied itself with socialist nations like Cuba, university students joined study groups that discussed Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi's Green Book series or the works of North Korea's Kim Il-sung. The pan-Africanism that characterized the Nkrumah era was also resurrected by the PNDC, culminating in the opening of the W.E.B. Du Bois Memorial Center for Pan-African Culture in 1985, and later uh, in the early 1990s, the Kwame Nkrumah Mausoleum, two important and historical sites in Accra today. Less well-known is the introduction and embrace of South Asian religions, namely Hinduism and Buddhism and the establishment of local congregations and communities. In terms of Hinduism, several groups formed in Ghana during the late 1970s and early 1980s, including Brahma Kumaris, the Divine Life Society, the Sri Satya Sai Baba Mission, and ISKCON, which is the subject of my talk today. These organizations were especially attractive to young people in urban areas, particularly on university and polytechnic uh, campuses. But it is important to make clear that Hinduism had existed in Ghana for at least several decades prior to the revolutionary era. So now I'll talk a little bit about the history of Hinduism in Ghana. Let me just take a drink of my water here. So the historical records indicate there were uh, Indian Hindus in Ghana as early as 1932. Um, but until uh, the 1970s, I would say, Hinduism as practiced in Ghana was a purely, um, you know, limited to uh, people of the Indian diaspora. Um, the Ghanaians were increasingly exposed to Hinduism though in the decades, first beginning with the stories that uh, Ghanaian veterans of World War II campaigns in South Asia and Southeast Asia brought back with them. Here's an image of uh, Ghanaian soldiers in India. And, uh, you know, the literature talks about Ghanaian soldiers telling these tales about the, the incredible powers of the Hindu deities and the ceremonies which, uh, you know, could affect a positive change in people's lives. And this is where we start to see this kind of popular perception of the supernatural powers of Hinduism in Ghana. The other thing which influenced these ideas was the real popularity of Indian South Asian films in Ghana in the 1950s and the 1960s and the 1970s. So very common for Indian films, uh, films in Hindi particularly to be shown in uh, cinemas in cities like Accra, Kumasi and Tamale, and even in smaller uh, towns throughout the country. And these films kind of reinforced these popular notions of Hinduism. Um, scholars like um, uh, uh, Bamfu Afori Atim who have written about 
this kind of like Ghanaian understanding of Hinduism. And he uh, talks about also uh, Ghanaians writing, having this correspondence with astrologers, South Asian astrologers based in India, but also in London and people sort of, you know, requesting uh, protection and power from these, uh, you know, sort of priests who were based abroad. And all of these things, you know, these correspondence with South Asian astrologers uh, abroad, um, these movie depictions, these uh, stories that were shared by Ghanaian veterans of World War II kind of reinforced this notion of um, the supernatural powers of Hinduism, which is still exists in Ghana today. Um, I was driving back from Kumasi to Accra uh, in August, or late July, sorry, when I saw this billboard on the side of the road um, in the Eastern region. And you know, I took it as the car was driving past, but you could see clearly the words India power at the top. And there's a depiction of a baby Krishna on that uh, billboard. So even today in a mostly Christian and Muslim Ghana, right, Christianity and Islam are the uh, major religions and as well as the uh, existence of Ghanaian uh, religions or what people like to refer to as African traditional religions, there are still some priests and advisors who invoke the powers of Hinduism. Good, so I want to uh, mention that uh, before I, I focus on ISKCON and its introduction into Ghana, there's another very important uh, Hindu community, African Hindu community in Ghana, and that's the Hindu Monastery of Africa, uh, which has been the, the topic of um, uh, some research, including the book by uh, Waku that I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, presentation. The Hindu Monastery of Ghana is very fascinating because it was founded by a Ghanaian Hindu priest, Swami Ganandanand Saraswati, who uh, on his own initiative um, studied in India and returned to Ghana and created this monastery which is today located in Accra. It's indirectly connected to the Divine Life Society in India. And today the Hindu monastery of Ghana has branches throughout the country, as well as in Togo and Cote d'Ivoire. And there's a number of prominent uh, Ghanaian celebrities and politicians who are members of the Hindu monastery of Africa. So that's a really fascinating um, story on its own this uh, indigenous Ghanaian Hindu monastery um, that is, uh, you know, the majority, the overwhelming majority of devotees at this temple are Ghanaian. And uh, there are also Indians who attend ceremonies uh, at this temple in Accra. So let's now return to Bhakti Tirta Swami, uh, who was responsible for bringing um, ISKCON to uh, Ghana or to making it more popular. So in the midst of the revolutionary era that I described earlier, ISKCON established itself in Ghana. There's some inconsistency in the sources about the dates and who was responsible for initially bringing ISKCON to Ghana. Um, my research is based uh, on archival materials that I've been able to collect in newspaper articles, but also oral history that I've collected from members of ISKCON in Ghana. Um, according to an article that was published in uh, one of the ISKCON journals uh, not too long ago, um, the official story is that ISKCON was bought to Ghana in 1980 by another disciple of uh, Srila Prabhupada, and that's Brahmanada uh, Dasa. Uh, Atiembo, the scholar I mentioned before, um, who wrote about the Canadian perceptions of Hindu power uh, argues that there were already uh, ISKCON uh, Hare Krishna devotees in the streets of Accra in the 1970s, but he's not very clear about when in the 70s and there isn't any kind of source for that claim. Um, but he does write that uh, the initial Hare Krishna devotees who were uh, preaching in Accra were met by two different reactions. And this is very interesting. One because uh, these reactions, I think, still uh, kind of um, are reflective of uh, present day uh, Ghana. One is those uh, Ghanaians who kind of, you know, welcome uh, the devotees and uh, 
are interested in the books that they are uh, sharing and uh, you know might want to uh, purchase some of the incense that they have available um, and who are curious about uh, you know this this religion and this movement. Um, a lot of scholars have written about how many of the Ghanaians who are attracted to ISKCON or the Hindu monastery of Ghana, which I mentioned just moments ago, are people who uh, maybe are abandoning Christianity or are disillusioned with the charismatic churches um, and maybe also don't want to embrace, you know, kind of what is properly perceived as the negative aspects of a Khan religion or a Ghanaian religion or African religion or whatever term we want to use and think of uh, Hinduism as kind of like an alternative, right? One that is not too different in some ways from African traditional religion and might have some more respectability in the public eye. This is what scholars have written about. And indeed, some of the uh, ISKCON devotees I've talked to um, kind of repeat these, these points. So some uh, Ghanaians you know, responded to these early disciples, these devotees on the streets of Accra in a, in a you know, kind of curious, positive, uh, intrigued way. And then others who kept their distance uh, viewing these kind of what they would think of as strange looking uh, preachers as sort of occultists or people you know, dabbling in uh, you know, idol, uh, idol worship or things like that. Um, it's important to uh, emphasize that ISKCON, before it came to Ghana, had already established itself in Nigeria. Um, in some of the same ways that I'm gonna talk about uh, in a few moments, but there were devotees in Nigeria who were also, uh, had a crucial role in introducing it in Ghana. So it's, you know, it's important to think of like ISKCON developing in Ghana uh, from these two kind of sources from other parts of the African continent, Nigeria in particular, and from parts of the African diaspora, the United States in particular. Um, so Nigerian devotees came to Ghana during this time um, that I'm talking about. And according to our sources, they were successful in making converts among some Christians. So now let me talk a little more detail about uh, Bhakti Chitra Swami, who's the the key figure in the story. Uh, I want to give you a bit of a biography so you know uh, who he is while we talk, before we talk about what he did in Ghana. Before he was given his initiate, initiation name, Bhakti Tirta Swami was known as John E. Favors, his birth name, at least until he went to college. Born in 1950, Favors grew up in a devoutly Christian home in a working class neighborhood of Cleveland. He is remembered by family, friends, and teachers as a good natured, kind, and smart boy who possessed a striking aptitude for preaching and a discipline for study, even at that young age. As a teenager, he was active in the Cleveland branch of the civil rights organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and increasingly identified with the politics of black nationalism. Reverend E. Randall T. Osborne, a leader in the SCLC, recalls favors asking in a brief encounter with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963. So this is uh, favors talking to Dr. King. Dr. King, why don't you use the word black instead of Negro? And why do you wear Western dress rather than a dashiki? In 1968, Favors began his undergraduate studies at Princeton University, where he majored in psychology and immersed himself in political activism and spiritual exploration. His civil rights activism deepened and he joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and worked with the Black Panthers. And his worldview became increasingly Pan-Africanist. At Princeton, Favors adopted the name Tashombi Abdul, co-founded a group called the Third World Coalition and spent six months in Jamaica. His favorite professor was the renowned Guyanese scholar, Jan uh, Karu, then at Princeton before his long association with Northwestern. He took a course on Kiswahili taught by Ali Mazuri, my former mentor at Rutgers. And he was friends with the Afrocentric, he was, uh, and with his friends, he studied the Afrocentric literature 
that was blossoming at the time. Remarkably, Favors, then known as Dashombi Abdul, was elected student body president at Princeton as an overwhelmingly white, largely Southern uh, conservative university. So he was quite um, politically active and um, very popular at Princeton, uh, which must have been a very challenging environment at the time. It was at Princeton too that Favors began his exploration of Hinduism, associating with different gurus, but eventually focusing on ISKCON. He stood out amongst the mainly white devotees, particularly since he continued to wear dashikis and a Muslim skull cap. One year after his graduation, Bhakti Tirta Swami was initiated by Swami Prabhupada in Los Angeles, by then a major center of ISKCON, and he embarked on several years of book distributions. So he was initiated by the, um, the guru that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation uh, as the founder of ISKCON. Um, I'm interested in Bhakti Tirta Swami's work in Africa, and that's what we're focusing on today. But um, in ISKCON, he's probably even more uh, famous for his preaching, you know, quote unquote, behind the Iron Curtain. He, uh, he spent uh, time in Eastern Europe in the, in the former Soviet Union uh, uh, doing proselytizing for ISKCON. By the end of the decade, in March 1979, he connected his work spreading Krishna consciousness with his undergraduate embrace of Pan-Africanism by traveling to Nigeria. ISKCON had already established temple communities in Kenya and South Africa, two countries with significant South Asian populations, though apartheid was entrenched in the latter, of course, at the time. And a few devotees were attempting to win converts in Nigeria. In 1979, Bhakti Tirta Swami was sent to Nigeria precisely because he was Black by ISKCON uh, leaders, with the assumption that he would be more successful connecting with Africans. Moreover, his celebrated a record of book distribution at campuses across the United States and his ability to preach in what were considered difficult places such as Eastern Europe made him an ideal candidate for the mission. Um, so the literature shows that you know, ISKCON um, was aware of the uh, you know, importance of uh, Bhakti Tirta Swami as an African-American, as a black guru uh, preaching in Nigeria in West Africa. From Nigeria, Bhakti Tirta Swami visited Ghana, taking along with him several Nigerian devotees. According to one source, he delivered lectures at the three main universities at the time, the University of Ghana in Accra, the University of Science and Technology in Kumasi, and the University of Caicos, and met with members of the Indian community in Ghana. As mentioned previously, university students were particularly receptive to learning about South Asian religions. Just, just this um, uh, summer, I learned um, that a, a relative uh, who's a former Eastern Regional Minister, uh, that would be like the equivalent of a governor here in the United States, uh, Eric uh, Kwache Dafur, told me that as a university student in the early 1980s, right at this time when Bhakti Tirta Swami and the Nigerian devotees came uh, to Ghana, he came across uh, Hare Krishna literature at the university library. And then he saw devotees in town chanting and he joined um, the movement very shortly thereafter and was actually initiated by Bhakti Tirta Swami. So this is a, um, a politician in the ruling party right now who until uh, a few months ago was the governor or the minister of the Eastern region and has been a member of ISKCON since the early 1980s. Prabhu Shribas, the current uh, president of the ISKCON temple, also joined the movement during the early 1980s and was sent to Nigeria for training. So this is really interesting. You have Nigerian devotees coming to Ghana, uh, African-American devotees coming to Ghana, and then people joining the movement in Ghana being sent to uh, Nigeria for uh, further uh, learning and training. In the, following, in the year following uh, Bhakt, Bhakti Tirta Swami's first visit, a local committee was established, a temple was founded in Accra, and ISKCON was officially registered in Ghana. 
And I've been, you know, looking through the archives of newspapers uh, for many years now, looking for documentation on ISKCON in Ghana during this time, um, you know, during this really exciting uh, period in Ghana's history. And uh, I stumbled across this ad in a 1983, April 1983 edition of the People's Daily Graphic, now called the Daily Graphic, um, Ghana's main newspaper. So uh, you can see um, in the ad here, the uh, has the address of the original temple, which was founded in Accra in the early 1980s, not the temple I showed you in that first image, which is now located in a town right outside Accra called Medie. Bhakti Tirta Swami returned to Ghana in 1982, a few months after the 31st December revolution that I talked about earlier, accompanied by African-American devotees. He appeared on a series of programs on state television discussing the beliefs and practices of Krishna consciousness. One of the reportedly regular and mesmerized viewers was J.J. Rawlings himself, who was then the chairman of the Provisional National Defense Council. According to an ISKCON leader quoted in Bhakti Tirta Swami's biography, Rawlings, quote, demanded a video of the program to be kept at home. And he also wanted to have uh, Bhakti Tirta Swami uh, meet with him for a private audience. And he spent several hours listening to Swami discuss the intricacies of Krishna consciousness. Prabhu uh, Srivast, the current uh, president of ISKCON in Ghana, told me that, quote, when Rawlings saw the program, he was impressed. He sent some officers to the temple to, invent, to invite the Swami to the castle. The castle is, um, was the residence of uh, President Rawlings at the time. He went and he met with him. It was said that Rawlings was so impressed, he called the broadcaster, the state broadcaster. He called the director of broadcaster to say, that Hare Krishna program, repeat it. So, you know, this is really fascinating that in this revolutionary kind of period, uh, you have on state television, uh, this African-American uh, Hare Krishna guru, um, you know, uh, doing a series of uh, uh, programs um, that are being viewed across uh, the country and reportedly by Rawlings himself. Moreover, senior ISKCON members claim that Rawlings distributed copies of the Bhagavad Gita as it is to his comrades and the PNDC government. When Rawlings once famously proclaimed, I do not fear God, it's one of the most famous uh, pronouncements of Rawlings even to this day in Ghana, when he once famously proclaimed, I do not fear God, many members of the Ghanaian middle and upper classes were aghast. In a nation where most everyone fears God, a belief rooted in both Niger Congo and West Asian cosmologies, Rawlings' statement not only seemed provocative, but more to the point foolish. In fact, Rawlings' declaration about God was informed by his exposure to the teachings of the Hare Krishna movement in Kordi, to uh, ISKCON leaders. In one of his books, Bhakti Tirta Swami himself explains, and this is a quote from the book, I was in Ghana in the 1980s and had been sharing different books with then President Rawlings. At one point while Ghana was suffering an internal crisis, I heard that Rawlings had gathered the heads of all the major religions institutions and criticized them for emphasizing too much the fear of God rather than his love. When I heard this, I understood that our teachings were helping Rawlings because some of the writings I had given him emphasized the highest aspect of the love of God. Thus, Hare Krishna devotees claimed their teachings had an impact on Rawlings and influenced his rhetoric. What is certain is that Rawlings interacted with ISKCON members most importantly, Bhakti Tirta Swami, and the activities of the organization, including the appearances on state television, were tolerated and maybe even encouraged. And I just wanted to take a moment to um, share a, a, a short video clip of Bhakti Tirta Swami visiting the temple, uh, the main temple in Ghana. And this is in the early 1990s and uh, preaching there in the temple, just for you to see him 
and hear him and um, since he's the focus of this talk. So let me see if I can share that, please. One second. Okay, so this will be about uh, one to two minute video clip. I hope it works. Let's see. Put that on. Okay, here we go. I just want to make sure, does everybody, um, can everybody see that? Can somebody um, put in the chat whether you can see that video if it's being shared? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me go back to uh, There we go, this one, thank you. Oh, sure. For re spiritualization. This is why it is very natural that we have leaders in society who are ready to lead by higher principles. The original culture of Africa and of all ancient cultures was established where the leader was a vice medium between the people and God. So the leader has the responsibility to act in such ways that it would bring blessing and benediction to the citizens in abundance. Every crisis that the world is confronted with has to do something with a crisis in leadership. <laughs> Um, so that um, video, a um, couple of things I want to point out. That that video was shared with. Um, can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah, you might just want to. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so that video, a few, few interesting things. Um, one, you might have noticed that uh, Bhakti Tirtha Swami was wearing Ghanaian cloth. Um, there were a number of chiefs that were there in the audience. Uh, at the temple, and um, you saw uh, how he was connecting, you know, in that very brief clip, you could see how he's trying to connect uh, the teachings of ISKCON to, you know, African culture, uh, African notions of leadership, um, and um, of course, you heard the Hare Krishna mantra at the end there. So that was a video clip uh, that was shared uh, with me by um, the temple president, uh, Srivas uh, Prabhupada, that I mentioned before. So Bhakti Tirta Swami, and I'm going to be concluding uh, now. Bhakti Tirta Swami returned to Ghana several times in the 1990s, including uh, that temple visit that was in the video clip, um, but passed away in 2005. Rawlings, of course, handed over power to an opposition party in 2000 and passed away just uh, two years ago in 2020. So in Ghana today, um, there are estimated to be about 20,000 Hindus, uh, which includes 2,000 uh, Indians or people of South Asian origin. So the vast majority of Hindus in Ghana are Ghanaian. And uh, the Hindu monastery of Ghana, the uh, temple that I had mentioned earlier in this presentation, is probably the largest community and the fastest growing. ISKCON has centers and communities across Ghana largely financed by Ghana's Indian population, though the devotees are mostly Ghanaians. The main center is the Sri Sri Radha Govinda Temple in Medie, 
just, just northwest of Accra, um, which you can see the image of here. In a complex that also includes a school for local students up to junior secondary level, a medical clinic, and the residences of, uh, the residences of uh, devotees. There are smaller communities of devotees across Ghana, particularly in the largest cities, as well as ISKCON farms in rural areas. Outside the main temple uh, is a memorial to Bhakti Tirta Swami, and every day devotees lay prostrate, prostrate before a, a framed photo of him prominently placed inside the temple. This story reveals another example of previously unknown obscure linkages between uh, African peoples across the Atlantic. Um, we can classify this as you know, a story of Pan-African uh, connections, a case of reverse diaspora, or even an example of Black internationalism. It's just another example of the ways and means by which Black people have connected are diverse and surprising throughout history. Here an Indian religion was embraced by Africans in Ghana, introduced by diasporic Africans and continental Africans from the United States and Nigeria, producing an Africanized form of Hinduism focused on a black guru and articulated in ways that have meaning to black people on the continent and in the diaspora. While previous research has examined the Africanization of Hinduism in Ghana and the cultural linkages between Africa and India, my research is shifting the focus on this topic from the Indian Ocean world to the Atlantic Ocean world, from the Indian diaspora to the African diaspora, and provides another instance of Black people connecting across the world. So thank you very much, and welcome any comments or questions. Thank you very much for a very fascinating talk. We usually hear about Islam, Christianity in Africa, not always Hinduism, and the connection with the diaspora is just fascinating. So please, if you have questions, you can type them. You can also raise your hands if you want to speak directly. I'm going to read one question. Uh, thank you very much. I want to know if there is any link between Hinduism and the Satguru Maharani group in southwestern Nigeria. That's from Akim. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure about that. And I don't know if Shobhana Shankar is still on the call, but she would know that answer. So um, that's a good question. And I'm not really sure. Um, but uh, I would, um, if you're really interested, I would uh, advise... Uh, connecting with Dr. Shankar at Stony Brook. I see there's another question uh, here. What is the name of the man that bought Hinduism to Ghana? I can't hear well. Let me um, type it in the chat here so that everybody has it. So that was his um, ISKCON uh, guru name. But he was born John Favors. Thank you. Um, should, I read, should I read this, Dr. Sar, or you, will you read it? You can go ahead and read it. It is easy to be suspicious that Bhakti Tita Swami simply found a way to raise his profile in Paragana through a new religious movement. Are there any concrete indications of such corruption, hypocrisy, or there are indications that he is indeed sincere and pure? Um, I haven't really. Um, I, I, they're, they're, you know, they're like in any kind of religious movement, there's some different um, kind of uh, debates within it. And um, after uh, Bhakti Tirta Swami uh, died in 2005, I think uh, was the date, um, I saw that there were some uh, kind of disparaging or critical comments made about him, but not uh, about his um, work in Africa specifically as far as I could see more about his teachings and maybe his lifestyle. Um, and then that he has very strong defenders. Um, you know, he didn't, uh, after that early period where he was on television in Ghana in the 1980s, after that, he visited Ghana a number of times. And, uh, but I don't have any indication that he sort of was well known in Ghana or that he had any kind of power uh, even over the organization there in Ghana. Um, but you know it's it, it's uh, typical in ISKCON 
um, that you know the gurus who initiate the guru who initiates you is is very important in your spiritual practice. So um, most of the devotees, uh, the senior devotees in Ghana, were initiated by him, which is why he has played such a central role even today in worship uh, services at ISKCON. I hope that answers the question. Um, what is the status? So with the uh, progress made by both Islam and Christianity, what is the status of Hare Krishna Ghana today is a question. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's, it, it can, it's, uh, I would say it's growing very slowly. Um, so, uh, you know, I mentioned before that the, an estimate, that's quite a, a dated estimate, but 2010, there was an estimate of about 20,000 Hindus in Ghana. I think that number is a lot higher now. Uh, ISKCON has several thousand members across the country, um, mostly Ghanaian, as I mentioned before. Um, I think it's, you know, a thriving uh, organization, but of course, the numbers in comparison with Christianity and Islam are minimal, very tiny, right? But they're visible. I mean, the temple is visible. Uh, people come to the temple uh, on Sunday for the Sunday feast and the Sunday service. Uh, many members of the Indian community come there. Um, they host their, um, you know, they do street um, worship uh, several times a year on important festival days in Hinduism. Um, you know, you can see Hare Krishna monks in town and across, especially uh, doing book distribution. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of hostility to the Hare Krishna movement and other non-Christian, particularly organizations by evangelical Christians. But I think there's also kind of an acceptance. Um, you know, I've come across many families, uh, you know, acquaintances, friends, family, they'll say, oh, well, I know somebody in our family who's a Hare Krishna devotee. Uh, can we say that religion plays a negative or positive role in the African diaspora? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's a big question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. It's not for me to, um, I think, answer that question. Uh, I think it's for uh, people uh, in the African diaspora to answer that question. But in terms of this research, you know, um, whether Hinduism or ISKCON is positive or negative uh, is not my concern. I'm more interested in the fact that, you know, that people across the Atlantic on the continent and the diaspora are connected via Hinduism, like many ways that people connect, right? But that, and they, they kind of re-articulated uh, the way they practice Hinduism as sort of a pan-African, um, almost political project, right? It's very powerful to have um, the kind of senior, senior guru in your temple, uh, uh, an African-American, a member of the African diaspora. And I think it was important for Bhakti Tirta Swami, um, who became this very important Hindu guru to connect with Africa, to you know, realize his kind of political and cultural um, aspirations when he was a younger man. Yeah, so I don't know if that answers the question, but that's, that's a big question, whether religion uh, is positive or negative in the African diaspora. Any other questions or comments? Anything at all? More than happy to answer <laughs> or clarify. I was just wondering if you came across some comparison between Hinduism maybe and traditional African religion. Yeah, so yeah, it's interesting because um, that's a very good question. I mean, as I think I briefly commented on how um, a lot of the literature by religious scholars and uh, anthropologists focuses on this question. So um, there's an argument that particularly with the um, spread of Christianity uh, and particularly evangelical, charismatic or Pentecostal Christianity, you know, the um, negative portrayal or uh, depiction of um, African traditional religion has, uh, you know, become even more pronounced. And um, a lot of the, the followers of Hinduism in Ghana, in both the Hindu monastery of Ghana and in ISKCON, have said that, you know, what attracted them to 
uh, Hinduism was its similarities with quote unquote African traditional religions. Um, Atiemu, one of the scholars I mentioned, makes the point that for uh, the leaders of the Hindu monastery in Iskand, um, they think of Hinduism as like the quote unquote, the original religion of the world. And African traditional religion is just one manifestation of that original religion of the world. And that what makes Hinduism in their opinion uh, better or superior or more acceptable or more accessible is the fact that there's a written a word, there's this a written text, as written scripture. Um, uh, and that, you know, makes it kind of like, uh, you know, uh, higher in the hierarchy of quote unquote traditional religions. So, you know, it's interesting, uh, a number of converts to Hinduism in Ghana are Christians, but it's interesting too that a number of them might have been people who came from families where African traditional religion, I'm not crazy about that term. Uh, I prefer to use terms like Niger Congo religion or specific like a Khan religion or Ewe religion or Yoruba religion. Because um, of my feeling, every religion is traditional, right? That's what makes it persevere and that's what makes it attractive. So, um, but African traditional religion, I guess, is the, you know, the, the, the common terminology used to describe it. I see a couple um, other questions on here. Wouldn't you think it would be interesting to explore the Nigerian group uh, and the adherents of Hinduism? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, thank you for that um, suggestion. And I'll uh, definitely um, explore that. Has Hinduism in Ghana taken an explicitly decolonial attitude? Uh, yeah, I think you know that's one of the factors that uh, is um, explains the appeal of Hinduism to a lot of um, followers is that uh, they associate um, Christianity in particular with colonialism, with British colonialism in particular. So um, there's this idea that um, you know they want to reject this kind of Western indoctrination and um, return to the roots, if you will, and Hinduism being you know, kind of an easier path than following uh, African traditional religion. Yeah, thank you for that, that question as well. If there are no other questions or comments, we thank you very much, Dr. Lerman, for coming and sharing your research with us. Thank you also for people for coming and asking your question. We'll see you next time. Oh, somebody has their hand raised. Maybe you can let them talk before we go. Okay. Thank you. You can un unmute your, yourself now and. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, after the coming of the uh, Hinduism religion in India, uh, in Ghana, does this have any social and uh, social political impact on the people? On the, I mean, uh, in the governance of, of the Ghana. Okay, can you repeat? I, I, you said after it arrived. I, what was the yes, the people started to practice the religion and it has more followers, as you've said. Right. Does it have any social uh, impact on that uh, on that on that people of Ghana? Uh, well, on the people who who, who um, embrace it, Hinduism, it definitely has. Yeah, impact. social and political impact. Does it yeah. have social and political impact? Yeah. So I would say uh, socially, culturally, right? You have um, Ghanaian uh, devotees that you know uh, embrace uh, you know aspects of South Asian culture that are you know not um, common in Ghana, right? So, for example, the dress and uh, the diet, especially, right? So vegetarianism uh, are not things that are uh, common in Ghana amongst non-Hindus or non-Buddhists. So it definitely changes their cultural uh, and social kind of world. Um, what's fascinating is that, you know, what I've seen with the friends I've made and the people I've interviewed at ISKCON is that, you know, people kind of inhabit two worlds, this kind of Hindu world um, where they're vegetarian and they dress in South Asian clothing and they follow Hinduism. And then they're their family world, right? Whether they're a Khan or Ewe or Northern or whatever, where they still have obligations to the family, attending funerals, um, you know, having family uh, and, and town responsibilities, things like that. Politically, what's interesting too is that um, 
I've found that among the devotees, there's a wide range of political positions. So there's people who support the ruling NPP, the National Patriotic Party, and there's people who support the uh, opposition National Democratic Congress. So politically, there's no consistency um, that I've found in terms of Ghana politics. But I would say there's a general kind of pan-African uh, uh, sensibility amongst devotees in um, ISKCON in Ghana, not only because of the role of Bhakti Tirta Swami, but because of the, the presence of devotees from other parts of the continent and diaspora. So it's, it happens very often that African-American devotees in the United States uh, come to pay a visit to ISKCON in Ghana. And that's been documented in, in ISKCON pop, pop, publications. Thank you. Akim, you can go ahead and ask your question. Thank you very much. I, 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 I sent a question earlier. Okay. I was wondering if there is the possibility of exploring uh, the, uh, if there is a link between Hinduism as practiced in Ghana uh -huh. and the Nigerian group I mentioned earlier, the Satguru Maharaji group. Uh -huh. Because from the description of the Hindu group you have described in Ghana, I observe, a, I mean, quite a lot of similarities. Wouldn't you think it would be interesting to find out if there is another Hinduism group in Nigeria um, and then the practice between those in Nigeria and those in Ghana, if there are similarities or otherwise between the two? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think I, I had already um, responded to that and I said, yes, thank you for that suggestion. Um, there are many, many uh, Hindu groups, not only in Ghana, but in Nigeria, uh, including um, ISKCON that I mentioned, the Hindu monastery. I mentioned a number of others at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and there's obvious similarities between them in terms of practices and beliefs. Um, and uh, yeah, so, but ISKCON is, you know, uh, its own organization with its own history and uh, continuity and practices across the world. Um, but as you mentioned, there are many different organizations, including in Nigeria, that have similar practices. Thank you. Are there any other um, questions? Emmanuel? Who, who should we? Um, Please can you hear me? Uh, Leo Zoom, thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, uh, Professor Dennis, thank you so much for uh, the presentation. Thank you. I'm Emmanuel from Ghana. Okay. And uh, currently I'm um, senior life college as a professor here. And uh, nice to meet you. I'm really intrigued about how you uh, you trace the historical context of the nation and how uh, our president, ex president Rawlings uh, led that coup that propelled many of our citizens to really be in line with the demand of the country. But I was wondering, since Ghana as a country has more than three religions, uh, traditional religion, uh, Christian religion, Islam, and a Hindu that came in afterwards, in your research, did you come across that conflict between the Hinduism and the traditional religion or any similarities that you saw as a researcher when you went to Ghana? The reason being that there are set, certain practices, which is then your traditional category, I mean, traditional religion that might have a conflict with the Hindu, the Islam, and the Christianity. In your research, did you come across them, or was that part of your scope? And can you share with us? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I haven't come across any kind of uh, conflict between uh, Hinduism and African uh, traditional religion. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, there's some suggestion that there's an easy kind of like uh, coexistence between the two. Like on the one hand, you know, a lot of um, Christians in particular have kind of, um, who look down upon African traditional religion or kind of uh, denigrate it, you know, lump Hinduism together with African traditional religions. So on the one hand, there's that kind of like, you know, dogmatic uh, intolerance, kind of Christian uh, aspect, uh, a, a, a kind of attitude towards Hinduism and African traditional religion. 
But on the other hand, there is that kind of like close, uh, even association amongst followers of Hinduism. So I would say if there's any conflict that uh, Hinduism has encountered, it has been mainly with uh, Christian uh, institutions that um, you know, view them as occultists or idol worshipers or um, otherwise uh, are hostile to their teachings. Um, but you know, not to any extent that there's any kind of like, you know, uh, physical or violent conflict or anything like that. I think it's more in terms of rhetoric, uh, words, um, as far as I know, right? Um, you know, this is part of the uh, nature of the explosion of evangelical, charismatic, Pentecostal Christianity since the 1980s. It's hostility, not only uh, towards any other religion, but particularly towards quote unquote traditional religions. I've done research in Brazil uh, where there's a real resurgence of uh, condomble, Afro-Brazilian religions in places like Bahia, um, where there is kind of physical violent, uh, you know, hostility towards those um, religions by Christians. So it wouldn't be unique to Ghana, but uh, in Ghana, I would say ISKCON has been largely let, left alone and allowed to exist and to grow on its own terms. I hope that answered the question. Um, is there any more? Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, let's let's be in touch. Dr. So that might be it, right, Dr. Saar? I don't know if there's any other questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, it seems that was it. Thank you again very much for coming and sharing your research with us. And thank you everybody for coming. We'll see you next time. Bye everybody. Thank you everyone.